Welcome back. My name is Bruce Walker and um, I welcome you to the last of the four lectures in this series on understanding COVID-19, this one entitled Creating a Vaccine. In my career, I've actually seen the evolution of two different epidemics. The first that, that, uh, that I was really involved in as a physician was the HIV uh, epidemic which has ultimately caused 76 million infections worldwide and, and 32 million deaths. SARS-CoV-2, on the other hand, has already caused 112 million infections and two and a half million deaths. But what's different about these two is that SARS-CoV-2 did that in a year, and it took years for HIV to uh, result in the number of infections that it generated, and I think we understand the difference there, that SARS-CoV-2 is a very transmissible virus uh, because it's a respiratory virus and, and can be transmitted by aerosols. You know, when I got started, the question was, when are we going to have an effective HIV vaccine? And that's really been the focus of my, of my work thus far. Well, we're 40 years into this, and we still don't have a successful vaccine. So I'm very encouraged by work that we have ongoing right now toward a preventive HIV vaccine uh, that is a, it's a clinical trial that's being conducted in Africa right now. And I'm very optimistic that this actually may prevent HIV infection. Um, and so while we're still 40 years in making an HIV vaccine, I think the question is how do we you know, how, what were we thinking when the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic emerged and how quickly did we think we'd be able to make a vaccine? So ideally, just to give some background in terms of what we're looking for with a vaccine, ideally antibodies from natural infection should provide immunity, meaning protection from subsequent infection. And we saw this slide before, somebody gets infected, the virus gets cleared and somebody ends up then with lifelong, hopefully, immunity or immunity for some period of time in case they encounter that uh, infection again. One of the things that was advocated early on by some was just to let the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, go its route, let people get infected and develop something called herd immunity. Uh, so here we have on the left uh, depicted a person who's infected, in the middle somebody who's immune, who's cleared their infection but has antibodies, and on the right somebody who's uninfected. And I'd like to use these to explain to you what herd immunity is. So here's an example of the absence of herd immunity. Some people in the community have been infected and have generated antibodies, but there are the majority of people who have not been infected and don't have antibodies and haven't been immunized. The likelihood that that infected person is going to come in contact with somebody who's uninfected and unprotected is just really extremely high. On the other hand, um, if many of the people in the community have been infected in the past or been vaccinated, then you have a situation where most people are not susceptible to infection. That way, if there now is somebody who is infected, the likelihood is that they're not going to pass that virus on, or it's gonna be much less likely that they'll encounter one of these rare individuals that isn't protected, and that really breaks the transmission chain. What we realize is that you know, the destruction from this disease, the fatality rate from this disease is such that we can't just let everybody get infected because it would result in millions and millions of deaths would overwhelm the, the, uh, the hospital systems. It's, it's just not a path forward. Um, and remember that even if people do get infected, we worry about these weakened antibody responses that we talked about in the second lecture, that the virus itself damages the immune system, so you have these weakened antibody responses. So the basic concept behind a, a creating a vaccine is really outlined on this slide. What we don't want to do is have somebody encounter the fully infectious virus that can do damage, but we want their immune system to be ready to engage that virus when it first appears. And the way we do that is by training the immune system to fight the virus by only showing the immune system key relevant parts of the virus.
that it can target so that when the true virus comes in, the antibodies are already there to be able to provide a defense. The basic concept is to create immunity following immunization. That's what vaccines are all about. So what one wants to do is get the body to see the spike protein. So it, by basically exposing just the spike protein, one can generate antibodies without any damage to the immune system. Now, how do you get the body to make those spike proteins or how do you deliver those spike proteins? On the one hand, you can make spike protein in a factory and then put it in a syringe and inject it. On the other hand, you can actually just deliver the genetic material through what's called a, a, a vaccine vector such that the body's own cells make the spike protein but no other SARS-CoV-2 proteins and use that to train the body's immune system to fight the, the virus. That's essentially what all of these vaccines that are in development right now, the leading vaccines, the ones that have uh, been given authorization for use are based on, is to avoid the immune system damage by immunizing, expressing the spike protein, exposing the body to just the spike protein, generating antibodies with the hope then that these antibody responses will be much more durable. So one of the questions that's worth thinking about right now is why would it be that some vaccines should require two doses? It turns out that there's a certain level of antibody that's required for protection. The first immunization may actually get you up to that level, but there's always a diminution from that peak level uh, down to sort of a steady state. So the second immunization is really geared to getting you up to high enough levels that then you have these durable responses. And the data that are coming forward now as we get further into this epidemic is that it does look like these vaccines are able to, to induce antibodies that are going to be durable for at least a year and maybe longer. So the next question I want you to think about is I, one I alluded to early on, it's taken us 40 years and we as yet still don't have an approved vaccine and yet I think that we have reason to be cautiously optimistic that we'll get an HIV vaccine. On the other hand, for SARS-CoV-2, the first cases were reported uh, less than a year before multiple vaccines became approved for use in, at least by emergency use authorization in humans. So how could that possibly happen without cutting corners? And I, I think that this is something really important to understand. It had to do with a number of different factors. One is the rapid identification of SARS-CoV-2. Within weeks of the first cases of this new pneumonia in Wuhan being identified, the sequence of the identification and sequence of SARS-CoV-2 had been established. Let's think back about what I said earlier about HIV. How long did it take from those first cases of what in retrospect was this new disease AIDS until we actually knew what the pathogen was? It took four years. So four years versus four weeks, a huge difference. And the difference there is the advances that have been made in science over that time the ability to rapidly sequence using polymerase chain reaction and new technologies that allowed for rapid identification of this new pathogen. The other key issue was that we had really unprecedented immediate information sharing. So as soon as the virus was identified in China and sequenced, that information was put on the internet so that everybody could take a look at it. And that allowed multiple different efforts to immediately begin uh, in terms of trying to make vaccines. The next was this adaptation of existing vaccine technologies. So for example, the vaccine that, that we've been using to work to, to fight HIV is one that was 15 years in development. On the other hand, once SARS-CoV-2 came, we could take that platform and immediately adapt it to SARS-CoV-2. There's been an unprecedented level of collaboration among scientists. It's really something I've never seen anything like this before in my, in my entire career, where 
people have really gathered together, pooled knowledge to try and make advances as quickly as possible. There's also been catalytic funding from biotech, government, and philanthropy that has allowed people to move forward with the greatest possible speed. There were huge clinical trials that were put forward to test these vaccines. You have to have enough infections occur in people to get placebo versus vaccine to know if your vaccine is working. So if nobody's getting infected, you can test a vaccine for a long time until you begin to see enough difference to see that there's a statistically significant difference if you get the vaccine or don't. Here, instead of what's typically maybe 2,000 patients in a clinical trial, these were trials of 40 or 60,000 individuals at a time when the virus was still rapidly spreading in, in many different communities. So lots of infections were happening. So there's a great opportunity to understand whether the vaccine was actually effective. And that, that's really the next point, that there were these ongoing high rates of transmission. And then the, really, I think the only risk that was taken was a, was a financial risk in terms of vaccine development. And that risk was that the, um, because of the funding that was available, the vaccine manufacturers took the risk by, as soon as they'd established the vaccine, as they started to test it in people, they started making, scaling up to make millions of doses on the hope that it would actually be proven to be effective. If it had not been effective, they would have had to throw all of those, those vials of vaccine away. And so this was really sort of responding to the urgency of the situation. We didn't want to wait another year after the trials were completed to scale up production. We needed to have the vaccine ready to go as soon as possible if it worked. And so, so yes, that was a risk. It was a, it was a calculated financial risk. And in fact, the vaccines worked. So those doses were able to be immediately deployed. What I've been talking about here is adaptability. We have a base of scientific knowledge around vaccines and we have different vaccine platforms. Those could be adapted right away to developing SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. I'll take you through what we've done with our HIV adenovirus vaccine that Dan Baruch developed. All it took was to, instead of splicing HIV genetic material into a normal cold virus, this adenovirus that was the vector that we used to express spike protein. So for HIV, what Dan had done was he had spliced some of the HIV genetic material into a cold virus that allowed the immune system to train in a situation to target HIV without ever seeing live virus. What Dan did in terms of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine was he took that ex exact same platform. Now, instead of using HIV genetic material, he used the genetic material that encodes for the spike protein, put that in this cold virus, this adenovirus, and use that as his vaccine vehicle. This is a virus that's originally a cold virus, but has been rendered so that it can't replicate on its own. Uh, it's injected and, uh, through a vaccine and it leads to the production of just the spike protein. And so really the, the results here were, were incredible in terms of the speed with which, uh, with which this went forward. The virus sequence was released early in January. Vaccine design began for this adenovirus vector three days later. Uh, the manufacturing was initiated on the, on the candidate vaccine by the end of March. By July, the vaccine was already in human trials, and by early 2021, there was massive scale up in emergency use authorization for what is being carried forward by, uh, by Janssen Pharmaceuticals. And similarly, other vaccines um, have, have also been done incredibly rapidly, and all of these are based on, on one of four basic concepts. One is a genetic vaccine. These are mRNA vaccines that I'll explain a little bit more. Inactivated viral vectors like the adenovirus vector is another method where you splice in some genetic material. Another is uh, using uh, viral protein that can be made in a factory uh, and given along with an immune booster called an adjuvant. And, and finally, 
um, you have inactivated uh, SARS-CoV-2 where basically the RNA has been disrupted in a way that the virus can no longer uh, cause any infection or damage, but still can deliver the spike protein to train the immune system. So how do these vaccines work? Here's an example for the, for the mRNA vaccine. These are very new vaccines, never before licensed, but have been in development for years, and that's a really important point. It's because of that that this platform could be deployed so quickly. So what the mRNA is, it's a little bit of RNA that's encapsulated in a tiny little oil droplet. That oil droplet is able then to fuse with a cell, inject the, ribosome, the mRNA such that the ribosome then starts to make spike protein. Those spike proteins are released, and now the body has something to train against to make antibodies, inducing those antibodies then uh, give the person a defense against the virus if it should encounter the infectious virus. On the other hand, the way the, the adenovirus vaccine works um, is basically it's a cold virus. It has a spliced piece of SARS-CoV-2 spike gene inserted into its DNA. And that does the same thing. Once it's in the cell, that spike gene is basically used to make new spike proteins that can go on to train the immune system. And so what are the vaccines that are available in the U.S. right now? Well, there are two of the genetic vaccines, mRNA vaccines from uh, Moderna and Pfizer. And there is the Janssen vaccine, the adenovirus vaccine that we've been involved in. There are a couple of others that may get licensed uh, in the near future. Novavax, which is a viral protein plus adjuvant, and the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is another adenovirus vaccine. There also are inactivated vaccines that are being deployed in other parts of the world but are not yet available in the, in the U.S. And, and have not been quite as uh, effective in terms of generating effective antibody responses. So um, let me just give you the results of what's happened with the J&J &J vaccine. Um, a study was conducted in um, the U.S., South Africa, and Brazil. Uh, just by chance, and the um, and it happened really at the time that this B1.351 variant was surging in South Africa. The protection against any symptomatic infection in the U.S. was 72 percent, 68 percent in Latin America, and 64 percent in South Africa. So a little bit less against this new variant, but protection against severe disease was 85 percent, and protection most importantly against hospitalization and death was 100%. So even though the vaccine didn't protect entirely from infection, it actually prevented the most worrisome sequelae of infection, which are hospitalization and death. So this is really good news, and the news is similar for the other vaccines. They protect against, um, uh, they protect against infection, but none of them is 100%. People can still get infected, but those infections are less lethal. Uh, across all of these different vaccines. Uh, so what about different ethnicities? This is a really important point in medicine in general. One has to think about whether these vaccines have been tested in the different populations that are affected by a disease. And so both the Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines were um, focused on making sure that they recruited a population that was representative of the population in the U.S. that was going to be given these vaccines. And so you can see from this that, that in fact, there, there, were, uh, the, there were diverse uh, ethnicities uh, and races that were tested, and the vaccine uh, overall was effective in, in all of these different situations. The big question that I've already alluded to will, is, will the vaccine-induced antibodies protect against variants? And, and here, um, we need to really think about um, how to actually answer that question. With the Janssen vaccine, it was actually tested at a time that the variants were there. The Pfizer and BioNTech mRNA vaccines were tested before variants became predominant in the, in the tested population. So what one can do is actually test the antibodies that are generated by vaccination, 
in a test tube to see if they can basically neutralize the, the virus. So we have these different variants of concern that I, um, that I had mentioned before, uh, particularly the one that was first identified in the UK and the one that was identified in South Africa. And what I show you here is actually the timing of the trial in South Africa. The adenovirus 26 Janssen vaccine was tested predominantly against a, a group of viruses that were mostly B1.351. On the other hand, if you look at where Moderna was tested, it was tested in the U.S. at a time that there were very few variants and none of these more, uh, the, these more severe um, uh, variants that seem to be more transmissible. But the, the, the reality is that for both of these vaccines and, and for the BioNTech vaccine as well, the laboratory tests show that there is uh, an ability to protect against these variants. And the way that that has been determined is by doing these studies in, in, uh, in the laboratory. And you can see that there's a little bit of a drop off here in terms of the neutralizing activity, which is the effective part of the immune system against this virus, or that's what we believe is the effective part. But it still remains high enough that they protect against these, uh, these other strains. Uh, and in fact, with the J&J &J vaccine, there's still 100% protection against hospitalization and death, even though there's been a law, there's a drop in neutralization against the variant. And um, the similar situation with the Pfizer vaccine and the same with Moderna. So that's all very encouraging news. But the thing that worries me is what do we, you know, the more chance we give this virus to replicate the more chance it has to mutate, to find a way to escape from the antibody responses that these vaccines have developed and, and lead us into a situation where we're really starting over again. So how do we protect against that? What, do we, what can we do now to, uh, to think about these variants that may be arising in the future? And um, that's really where we can think about booster shots where we actually start to look at, rather than using the original Wuhan strain of virus, uh, the genetic material for that spike protein, use instead the spike protein of some of these variants, or even a cocktail of these, to generate broader immune responses to the variants that are arising in the world. And so that's show, shown schematically here. Rather than just that original spike protein, you use a bunch of different ones, you immunize a person with that, and you get this much more diverse immunity generated, uh, which hopefully then will protect against the other variants and even potentially new variants as they arise. So that's a strategy that we have that we can use. Another way that we can think about this is to, is to harness another arm of the immune response to eliminate cells that get infected before progeny viruses are produced. And the way to do that is to induce cytotoxic T cells that I told you about before, which can recognize an infected cell and kill it before progeny viruses are produced. And so um, this is essentially an additional way that we can enhance immunity potentially by having an antibody and a T cell based vaccine that then provides even hopefully more robust protection and there's a lot of interest now in developing these T cell vaccines in addition to the, um, in addition to the antibody based vaccines. Another thing to be aware of though, is that you can make any drug you want or, or vaccine you want. And if people don't use them, they're you've really not accomplished much. And I think the problem that, that is uh, to some extent understandable is that there are lots of roots of mistrust that have led to what is called vaccine hesitancy, where people are not anxious to take a vaccine because they, they are suspicious. Um, and there's, a, there's historical roots of this mistrust from baseline inequities, limited access of certain populations to high quality care, longer wait times, more illness, worse outcomes, premature deaths, and discrimination, racism, and anti-immigrant sentiment that I think all fuel this. And this is a, 
this is a major issue. We need to get to the point where everybody has immunity to this coronavirus so that we can stop the pandemic and we can prevent the virus from finding a new pathway to avoid recognition by the immune system. How are we approaching that? Well, I mentioned earlier that there is there has been this tremendous amount of, of collaboration globally that has occurred. We here in Boston have established something called the Massachusetts Consortium on Pathogen Readiness, not just to, to bring people together to fight COVID-19, but to prepare for the next pandemic. So this involves Harvard, MIT, Tufts, UMass, and Boston University, as well as all of the academic teaching hospitals, the Reagan Institute, the Broad Institute, um, Children's Hospital, et cetera. And by bringing all of these people together, we've been able to pool knowledge and make much more rapid progress. I think we need to continue this, and we really need to be ready now for the next pandemic. Um, and that uh, we can anticipate that there will be a next pandemic. The other thing that we're doing at the Reagan Institute is we're expanding our facilities and we're building a, a program really f to focus on harnessing the immune system to prevent and cure human diseases with a real focus on pandemic preparedness. And so the Reagan Institute was established in December of 2008. We're now um, uh, 12 years into this, uh, to this process and we're delighted to be in, on the cusp of of moving into a, a new building where we'll be able to expand our focus, increase the number of diverse scientists working together to try and come up with solutions. So let me make a few key concluding remarks related to what I've just said. Natural infection will really not lead to herd immunity and that underscores the need for an HIV vaccine. SARS-CoV-2 vaccines were developed in less than a year, but they weren't developed with shortcuts. They were developed because of the tremendous scientific progress that's been made in the last, uh, in the last two decades and more. The emergence of variants is of concern, but at least thus far, we have reason to be hopeful that the kinds of immune responses that are being generated are going to be protective and that we have ways to further enhance those to become more broadly protected through protective through booster shots using some of the new variants as they arise, underscoring the fact that we really have to have a, sent, uh, you know, a sentinel system to sequence viruses and know those variants, identify them as soon as they arise, know which ones are the most lethal, and much in the way that we change the influenza vaccine each year, do the same thing with booster shots uh, as needed for, for the COVID-19 disease. And, and finally, uh, Vaccine-mediated protection from variants is underway, and um, we, we, we do have that backup. Meanwhile, the vaccine rollouts are happening in a very um, disproportionate way in terms of looking at this from a global perspective. And I would end really with saying that we, we have to think about this as a, um, as a global effort that we have to all be involved in because Anywhere the virus is replicating, it has a chance to, to become stronger and more transmissible and more lethal. And we have the wherewithal through vaccination to prevent that from happening. And, um, and that's just what we have to do. So I, I hope what you've learned from this course is that there has been a tremendous global effort that's been put forth with unprecedented levels of collaboration that has led to a solution for this pandemic in less than a year. Now the challenge to us is to get everybody vaccinated to prevent the virus from being able to replicate anywhere because every time it replicates, it has a chance to outwit the immune responses that we've generated from vaccines or that have been generated by natural infection. We have the ability to do that we have the, the vaccines available. Now we have to make sure that we get those to people and, and put a final end to this pandemic.